The Three Hours Agony of Our Lord Jesus Christ by Rev. Peter Gilday Prayer and Introductory Prayer on the Seven Words of Christ on the Cross Blessed be the sweet name of Jesus Christ, our Lord God, and of the most sweet Virgin Mary, his mother, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who, while hanging on the cross at thy life's close, spake seven words that we might always have these holy words in remembrance, I beseech thee by the virtue of those seven words, that thou wouldst forgive and spare me whatever I have sinned and misdone by the seven deadly sins, or their fruits, namely through pride, avarice, lust, envy, anger, gluttony, and sloth. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, as thou saidest, Father, forgive those who crucify me. Make me for love of thee to forgive all who wrong me. And as thou saidest to thy mother, Woman, behold thy son, and to thy disciple, behold thy mother. Make thy love and true charity unite me to thy mother. And as thou saidest to the thief, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Make me so to live that at the hour of death thou mayest say to me, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And as thou saidest, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Make me to say in all times of sorrow and tribulation, O Lord, my Father, have mercy on me, a sinner. Rule me, my King and my God, who hast redeemed me with thine own blood. And as thou saidest, I thirst, that is, for the salvation of the holy souls, who were in limbo, expecting thy coming, make me always to thirst to love thee, the fountain of living water, the fountain of eternal life, and to desire thee with my whole heart. And as thou saidest, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Make me in my last hour to be able to say fully and freely, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Receive me coming to thee, because thou hast now set a certain time to my life. And as thou saidest, it is finished which signifies that the sorrows thou didst bear for us, miserable sinners, are now ended. Make me deserve, when my soul goes hence, to hear that most sweet word of thine. Come, my beloved soul, for now I have resolved to make an end of thy pains. Come, and with me and with my saints, and elect, enter into my kingdom, to feast and rejoice and dwell therein, for ever and evermore. Amen. Attributed to the Venerable Bede. Introductory. With these I was wounded in the house of them that loved me. Zechariah 13, 6. It was a day of crime in Jerusalem. The streets leading from the holy city to Calvary were choked with a surging, excited mass of men, women, and children. The most tragic scene in the drama of the world's history was about to be accomplished. God's chosen people were on their way to crucify God's only begotten Son. Feverishly, hurriedly, at the head of the insolent, threatening crowd, the Roman soldiers urged the innocent victim of man's hatred on to Golgotha, a long, rough road, a road blessed since that day by the holy veneration of every Christian heart, opened up menacingly before the eyes of the Lamb of God. Along that sorrowful way, Jesus was dragging the heavy badge of infamy, the cross of malediction. The cruel, weary night of Holy Thursday was over. His sacred body, torn and bruised by the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, bathed in blood which trickled down from the wounds made by the crown of thorns, and lacerated by the awful scourging, was now swaying beneath the leaden load of the cross. As the procession passed through the gate of judgment, his strength fled from him, and he fell on his face, exhausted. The Cyrenian and his sons were entering the city at that moment, and they were ordered to carry the cross to Calvary's hill. There is no word of pity for Jesus, no sign of sympathy. Only five days before, and many in that cruel throng had accompanied him from Bethlehem with shouted hosannas and palm branches of victory in their hands 
proclaiming him the royal son of David, and blessed forever as one who came to them in the name of the Lord. And now he went on alone, betrayed by one apostle, denied by another, forsaken by the rest. He passed along alone in the midst of Christ for his death, and only the hearts of a few women had the courage to feel pity for the man of sorrows. A little love Jerusalem seemed to have left, and the group of women who were following close to Jesus lifted up their voices in lamentation, wailing and beating their breasts. Even this sympathy Jesus denied himself. He turned towards them, saying, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not over me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. One woman, a friend of our blessed lady, and very dear to her, with more courage than the rest, pushed past the crowd following him, past the soldiers who surrounded him, and presented a cloth to wipe the blood from his face. Our blessed Lord answers not a word at this touching mark of charity, but tears spring from his sacred eyes, and lo, on the linen cloth, his image is printed, and Veronica remains forever in Christian tradition as the model of heroic strength and courage. Calvary was reached at last. The cries of the multitude ceased, and all eyes were turned towards the little group that stood on its hill. Jesus was about to die the most heart-rending death ever known to humanity. Pity now seems to have reached the heart of the crowd at last. A draught of wine mingled with myrrh had been prepared by some wealthy women of Jerusalem in order to lessen the pangs of his crucifixion. The two malefactors who were to die with him drank freely of it, but when it was offered to Jesus in a sublime act of heroism, he refused it. He looked death in the face, fearless and unafraid. His sacred heart was determined to offer his eternal Father every possible reparation for the sins of the world. God's justice would be redeemed to the last farthing. The three crosses were now laid on the ground. That of Jesus was in the middle. He was seized roughly by the soldiers, stripped of his garments, and placed upon the implement of torture. His arms were stretched along the crossbeams, and into the center of those divine hands. Long, rough nails were driven up to the hilt. Then through both feet nails were also plunged, tearing their way through the quivering flesh. At the sight of this inconceivable horror, the crowd broke away from the soldiers and stood aghast at the fearful spectacle. And then the accursed tree, with its living human burden hanging upon it in helpless agony, and suffering fresh torture with every movement, was slowly lifted up with strong arms and fixed firmly in the hole prepared for it. As the cross fell into place, it seemed as if the body of Jesus would be wrenched from the nails. The cross swayed for a moment or two, and then the long, bitter agony of the three last hours of his life had begun. They had dug his hands and feet. They had numbered all his bones, as the royal psalmist had predicted. Between heaven and earth he hung there. Every hand that wished could strike. Every insult, every word of hatred could reach him. Thronging about the foot of the cross, the motley crowd of soldiers and officials, and Jews from every quarter of Judea, passed and repassed, ready to abuse, to outrage, to torture even, the divine victim of love. Pharisees and Herodians, priests and Levites, young men and old men, women and children, gathered near to watch the crucifixion and death of the Lord. The soldiers played dice, sitting apart where they could keep watch. The whole scene meant nothing to them. They were Romans of Rome, of a race which had never known the finer instincts of manly tenderness. And as they watched, the scene grew in brutality and horror. It was a tragedy of the wildest tumult. All the powers of evil seemed to have entered into the souls of the Jews, and were buffeting and breaking themselves against the wood of the cross as the angry sea lashes itself to death against the immovable rocks of the shore. 
Foremost among them, their leaders spent themselves in mocking the Son of God. The crowd grew bolder, and cries of derision went up to that dying heart, cries of mockery for his apparent inability to save himself. Wagging their heads in contempt, they blasphemed him. Vah, thou that destroyest the temple of God, and in three days buildest it up again, save thy own self. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Unmoved by the sight of his helpless anguish, they continued their taunting invectives, and in the midst of his speechless agony they fling up to him the heartless words, If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. You saved others. Yourself you cannot save. If you are the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, and we will believe in you. All about him, the spirit of hatred, whirled as if lashed into passion by the winds of scorn and contumely. The soldiers, too, caught the malign spirit of the moment, and the two thieves also joined in deriding him. The hideous infection seemed to spread from Calvary's hill and to cover the whole world. The cross of Christ, as the center of that world, like the tree of life of knowledge and of good and evil in paradise, felt every gust of passion, every wild hurricane of sin, from Adam's day down to our own. But in the midst of all this course of infamy, Jesus was silent. Throughout the whole of the procession from Pilate's house to Golgotha, only once had he broken his royal silence. And now, nailed to the cross, nothing was more eloquent with the proof of his divinity than that silence which mystified, as well as terrified, all on Calvary. Seven times Christ opened his lips to speak as he hung there, and every time a terrorizing wave of fear swept over the multitude who were watching him die. All over Calvary there was an undertone of fearful dread. At any moment this miracle worker might open the heavens and let loose the legions of angels of God, as he once threatened to do and might take flaming vengeance upon his enemies. Almighty God had declared more than once that he would not always suffer patiently and leave his enemies go unpunished. But Jesus had willed to die unavenged. From the four wounds, as from the four rivers of paradise, his blood began to flow over the world, purifying it and burning up all the evil which existed therein. Every act of Jesus in these last three hours of his life is full of significance for the Christian heart. He has passed from insult to insult, from torture to torture. He has seen himself betrayed by Judas, denied by Peter, forsaken by the other apostles and disciples. He has been the victim of the envy of the high priests, of the mockery of Herod, of the weakness of Pilate. He hangs there exhausted, dying from the long stretch of the physical and mental agony. He has undergone. And yet, never was he more divine than during these last hours of his earthly life. Before the eyes of his eternal father, the ignominious wood of the cross was slowly changing into an altar. The shame with which they had covered him was turning into glory, and the very tablet they had nailed to the cross in mockery and derision proclaimed loudly to the world from that day to this that this is Jesus, the immortal Son of God. This is the God-man who came to redeem the world. This is the Master whose last words we are to meditate again this sorrowful afternoon. The seven words of the blessed dying Christ passed unheeded and misunderstood over the throng on Calvary. But there are hearts filled with faith, eyes filled with tears, and souls burdened with sorrow, kneeling around a million Calvaries today. Christ Jesus looked in vain for one that would grieve together with him, and for one that would comfort him, and found none. Gall and vinegar, insult and outrage they gave him. That terrible day of the first Good Friday. Today, from one end of his father's world to the other, his children are kneeling at the foot of the cross, begging him to open their eyes, to illumine their understanding, 
to soften their hearts with the fire of love, that they may feel in themselves those cruel pains and that unspeakable suffering. Remember, Lord Jesus, that thou hast promised, that when thou shouldst be crucified and raised up from the earth, thou wouldst draw all things unto thee. By reason of our sins we are less than nothing, yet we are thy creatures and the work of thy hands. Draw all to thee this day, O Lord. Let not us be excluded. Take us up to thee and unite our hearts with thine. Change us wholly into thee. Grant us, O Lord of our souls, that thou alone mayest reign and live in us, that we may live in thee crucified. Never quit our hearts an instant during these hours, while we meditate thy passion with Mary, thy mother, with John, with Magdalene, and the others. Never leave our sight, our desires, our love. Let all else pass away from us. Do thou alone remain with us, O crucified Jesus, the love of our souls, Jesus the way, the truth, and the light. Jesus our only good, our whole treasure, our entire blessedness. Silence all the troubles and cares that clamor within our hearts. Speak thou alone to us, our glory, our hope, our crucified and only true friend, Jesus. <laughs> 